everyone, welcome to China Through Sunglasses. I'm Jingnan. And I'm Wu Fan. Welcome to new viewers and for those who've always been here. If you're ever curious about who the person is that's always screaming into your ears and crying about movies, that's Wu Fan. <laughs> and the one ranting about capitalism in China and agonizing over how censorship is ruining everything, that's Jingnan. Yes. So now that you've known us a little better, today we're going to be talking about Chinese films. So a little disclaimer, neither of us claim to be film experts, <laughs> neither are we Chinese film experts. Mm. We are just casual enthusiasts of movies, we mm. just like to watch movies. a small cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> try to be cultured, <laughs> but we also try very hard not to sound like pretentious film majors mm. that are complaining that Marvel movies are ruining everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But along the same vein, we, are also, we also have a bit of teenage angst about the way Chinese films are in China nowadays. So we'll go into that. Yeah, same with every other episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a little bit about the topic that we're going to talk about. We are not going to dive into pre-modern China cinema mm. because that is a whole other you know, giant ball to tackle. We are mm. going to focus on Chinese movies after the independence of modern day communist China. Mm because that's plenty to talk about already. We'll be going chronologically somewhat to follow the timeline so that it's easier for you to keep track. Okay, so the first film in modern China was produced in 1964, and it was led by the then first premier of China, who is Zhou Enlai. And he wanted to create a film that encapsulated the success of modern China and the whole nationalistic image that it's supposed to portray back then. So it was a film that combined musical elements with dance, with song, and also with poetic writing. And it was called Tong Fang Hong. And the reason why it's so important, not just socially, but also in terms of technological advancements in China, was because it was China's first uh, colored film. Back then in China, because media has to be state endorsed, right? So a lot of the people who are involved in the filming are actually also like part of the Wen Gong Tuan. So people who are involved in uh, musicals and uh, dance productions, but attached to like the army, basically. So mm -hmm. they provide entertainment. Yeah, so the first film was called Dong Fang Hong, and Dong Fang Hong literally means like the red color of the east, yeah. which is the symbol for China and, and Mao Zedong. <laughs> yeah, like I think there's a song Dong Fang Hong Tai Yang Sheng Zhong Guo. Chu like a Mao Zedong. That's yeah, my grandma. Knows. That's my grandmother's like favorite song. She just like to sing that album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like a childhood memory for our grandparents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like a core memory for them. <laughs> Social memory. Yeah. And then after that, there were quite a few films that were produced along the same vein. So I remember Zhi Qu Wei Hu Shan, Hong Deng Ji, Bai Mao Nu, and Hong Se Niang Zi Jun. And I find it very interesting how I know of these films because it's totally not my era. Yeah. And I did not grow up, grow up with these like nationalistic um, sensibilities. Mm. But at the same time, I feel like the adults in my family, they keep making references to like the good old days or like the glorious films that were created in the past. <laughs> which is a bit concerning, but at the same time, you can see the kind of social impact that these shows had. And um, another reason why these shows are so important is, or rather, another reason why these shows have been embedded in social memory for so long is because I know that for the Spring Festival Gala, like Chun Wan, um, sometimes there'll be like Xi Ju or like Jing Ju segments to it. And then they will sing all these classic songs. So like mm. the Dong Fang Hong Tai Yang Sheng, and then there's the Nai Nai Ni Ting Wo Shu, Wo Jia Na Biao Shu, Shu Hu Qing, Shen Me Dou You Ke Hong Liang De Sing or something. I don't know that. Like I can I can regurgitate all these lyrics, and I have never watched these films myself. Yeah, I yeah. think um a lot of this because it was state pushed, so mm. it was the only source of entertainment for a lot of people. Mm. Hence, like imagine if you could go if you went to a cinema and the only movies you could watch for years on end were those that were sponsored by the state mm. and pushed by the state, then at some point you're gonna grow very familiar with their works. The category of movies that we're really talking about right now is small Tian Guo or like nation building. So mm. this was in the early stages of China, communist China's history, as well as you see a very strong influence by the state government. And these movies still exist today, but it really was the primary and certain at some point the only source of entertainment in terms of films that were allowed in state China mm. because of the Chinese Cultural Revolution that lasted between 1966 and 1976. So it was a whole 10 years where the arts were completely repressed mm. and even like artists were being hunted down, you know, humiliated. Teachers also. Teachers. It was a whole shit show that we are not going to get into. Yeah. But the thing is, at that point in time, the only movies that were allowed to be screened were those that were allowed by the state mm -hmm. and produced by the state, actually. Mm. So this is a whole genre of films that I guess 
is not very prominent in other countries because there are patriotic films like let's say Hollywood like mm. you will see certain I guess the best way I can explain it is US saving the whole world kind of yeah films. but those are already like all the films <laughs> those are all the films in Hollywood <laughs> So I guess the best comparison you, I can get is if Top Gun Maverick was an entire genre, like uh, was, an, was an entire genre of its own, and it was state produced as well as you know pushed by the state, and that's the only thing that people are allowed to consume. Mm. So the, it was very nationalistic, very patriotic, and it very much perpetuated the single narrative that the Communist Party wanted to ingrain into its people, which is "We saved you. This is much better than everything else you have." This sounds a lot like North Korea, but this was early Chinese. <laughs> movies um, back when China was actually very communist <laughs> now not so much now not so much yeah. yeah so you will see that Chinese films have really progressed and mm. grown in different directions since then mm. and a very interesting thing is these films were called Zhu Xuan Li back then which means main melody but honestly by main melody we mean only melody <laughs> But the thing is, this sentiment of um, nation building, Jian Guo films being Zhu, Zhu Xuan Li still carries over till today. So a lot of the actors, if they want to make it big and they want to feel like they have progressed as an actor, they will want to make sure that they have sh- um, they have acted in one Zhu Xuan Li film before. Yeah, because that's considered the you the have epitome. made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, making it. Yeah. So moving on from the 60s and 70s to 80s. So we cannot talk about Chinese films without talking about Hong Kong films and Mm. Hong Kong cinema. Mm. So we are going to try and cover a little bit of Hong Kong cinema, but you have to understand that Hong Kong cinema is very different from mainland cinema. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason why I'm bringing up Hong Kong cinema in the 80s is because of this one very legendary director, Zhou Xingqi. Zhou Xingqi is very well known for his comedy films Mm. uh, that really peaked in 80s, in the 80s, and a lot of it became core memories for those who grew up in China in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. So some of the most famous ones include Du Sheng, Tang Bo Hu Dian Qiu Xiang, Jiu Ping Zhi Ma Guan, Xi Yu Ji, Yi Bai Ling Yi Hui Zhi, Yue Guang Bao He, Shao Ling Zhu Qiu, Xi Ju Zhi Wang, and Chang Jiang Qi Hao. Mm. So as you can tell, he's actually, I think, a, I think a characteristic of Hong Kong cinema is that they are very productive. In the sense that <laughs> the, the movies come out like, I don't know, on a factory line. They will pump out movies at like god speed. For Hollywood, if you take a look at how a lot of the studios as well as the actors and actresses film movies, they will take a they will take out a project and then they will rest for a couple months and then they will take out another uh, project. Okay. But for Hong Kong, it was you finish shooting this movie, you go straight into the set of another movie. Mm. And the same goes for all the cast, the directors, um, screenwriters, everybody is constantly working. So they really be pumping out the movies. Mm. I know that within the Hong Kong entertainment industry, there's a workaholic culture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But anyway, for Zhou Xingqi, a hallmark of his movies is the fact that it's very funny mm. and he has his own kind of humor called Uli Toh, which is like absurdist. Yeah, like it's it's like nonsensical, but within the nonsense, there's a certain logic that once the audience gets the reference, it really, really clicks. And I feel like it accentuates the humor even more because it's very contextual. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have any memories of watching it? I only watched COG Yue Guang Bao He mm. because apparently it was so good. Yes. And it was like a milestone, like a cultural reset for a lot of people's childhood. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of, like people still talk about it to this day, even though it came out in the 1980s. Is it like the one tier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, 如果我要为这个爱, 奉上一个期限, 那就是一万年. <laughs> oh, and then the, <laughs> 我, 我希望我的爱人, uh, 踏着七彩白云, like, oh my God, yeah, 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 these are some very iconic lines and quotes from the yeah. movie that is still being circulated very widely on social media to this day. Yeah, yeah. So I also think that it's very much nostalgia bait for the people who were born in the 80s because this is the kind of movies that they grew mm. up with. Yeah, so like context for this show is actually based on one of the four like legendary novels back, back in ancient China. And it's like Journey to the West, basically. Yeah. But Zhou Xingqi adapted it such that it had a lot of nonsensical elements such as like the main character dancing together with some of the side characters and like a lot of weird jokes. But at the end of the day, you can see that um, the kind of things that people take away from this show is like the romance mm. aspect of it, not just the comedic aspect also. Yeah, like I feel like he's a very talented director, mm-hmm. but his humor is an acquired taste. You have to really get it in order to get it. Mm. But it's, it's very different from the slapstick humor that we are kind of used to or mm. like the dry humor that's very iconic in like British comedy so it really depends on whether or not you can understand and get used to this mm. his particular brand of humor mm. because I would say that this is very distinct from other Chinese humor mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. yeah yeah brief way to like 
encapsulate the kind of genres that he went into. I feel like there's definitely some historical elements. Mm. And then he also had like this entire gambling series and that yeah. was very like cool mafia boss underdog trying to gamble his way out kind of storyline. And there's also like some Kung Fu series. Like he literally had a show called Kung Fu yeah. where he as the main character unlocked a bunch of like cool Kung Fu moves and stuff like that. And a lot of his films also center around like action-packed scenes mm. which add on to like the more physical aspect of humor. Mm. Yeah. So moving on from the 80s with the comedy scene, um, we are going to go into the 90s where, of course, some of these movies branch into the late 80s as well as like the early 2000s, mm. but we're going to categorize them under the 90s. There isn't a specific genre. If there is, I guess the nearest genre would be like art house. Mm. Yeah, but essentially the 90s saw the rise of a lot of mainland Chinese directors that uh, produced a lot of cult classics that mm. won yeah, a lot of yeah won a lot of awards all over the world and mm. different film festivals and really are still some of the most iconic Chinese films to this day. Mm. So we will cover more about the specific works, but some of the directors include Zhang Yimou, Li An, Chen Kai Ge, Wang Jia Wei, and Feng Xiaogang. Mm. So we will go into more detail later. Mm. So moving on from the early 90s, we saw a drastic change in how Chinese film industry operated in the late 90s. So this is also kind of the reason for recent Chinese cinema to be really very, very poor in quality. Essentially, during the late 1990s, there were mm. economic reforms that led to large-scale privatization, which led to the skyrocketing of GDP. Essentially, China transitioned from a third world country into a arguable first world country or I mean some of the or an economic sense maybe. or an economic sense yeah. for certain cities we understand there's a very big wealth gap yeah. but essentially it propelled a lot of Chinese citizens to suddenly have a lot of money overnight it seems movie making became a game for the rich to get richer mm. essentially capitalism got involved yeah, the entertainment industry became a very money circulation kind of industry. Yeah, instead yeah. of people making movies for the sake artistic of... Artistic pursuits. Yeah, for the artistic pursuit and career, mm. people got into making movies because they saw it as a quick way to make money. Mm. Due to the money that was involved, as well as the lack of Chinese identity or a specific aesthetic within the Chinese film making mm. industry, this led to a lot of knockoffs of Hollywood blockbusters. Essentially, if you are imagine you are an investor, right? and you really want to make money quickly, what would you rather do? Would you rather take risks and take the chance of developing your own style, your own story, and your mm. own voice? Or would you just take a look at some of the most highly grossing films that are produced in the West and just say, let's take their plot, let's take their characters and just make it Chinese and try and sell it to our audiences. Mm. Of course, the second one seems like a safer bet. So that's what essentially what happened. And due to that, there were a lot of copying of things like CGI and storyline. And the, but the thing is, the context doesn't really mesh as well as the values. So mm. a lot of the times, it was not the best reproduction of what was already available in the market. Mm. But it was what the people had easy and ready access to, which mm. we will we elaborate on later. So overall, it was the mass commercialization of an art form due to investors wanting speedy returns for their high investments. And a lot of what we're currently mentioning right now is credited to a YouTuber called Accented Cinema in one of his very good YouTube video essays. <laughs> yes, we really do love him. Thank you should you. check him out. I think he's a very good video essay YouTuber mm. for Asian cinema or non, you know, English cinema in general. His pacing and editing is impeccable. Honestly. Yeah, honestly, shout out to him. Yeah. <laughs> So moving on to the 21st century, from the 2000s to the 2010s, we see a lot of Xiao Yuan Ju. And Xiao Yuan Ju refers to um, school life shows. Um, a lot of them in involve growing up pains and stuff like that, which is why it's also called Qing Chun Teng Tong Wen Xue Dian Ying. And if you think about like um your teenage years, there's probably a lot of like teenage angst and like emo storylines and like love stories that are like unresolved and that's what a lot of these shows are about. So there's stuff like Zuo Er Cong Cong Nan Nian, Zhi Zi Hua Kai, Huo Er Jin Xia, and Zhi Qing Chun and Qi Yue Yu An Sheng. is actually a Taiwanese film adapted from a Taiwanese novel of the same name. Mm. So this reinvigorated the Qing Chun Teng Tong Wen Xue genre. Like we mentioned, a lot of it actually started and originated as novels mm. that people read when they were in their teenage years and they resonated with a lot of the growing up struggles, including college en entrance exams, dating for the first time, getting your heart broken during graduation season, <laughs> and like drifting apart because you start work, etc. Mm. And now that these readers who used to be teenagers became adults, they have the purchasing power to go into the movies and watch their favorite books get adapted onto the big screen. Mm. So 
I would personally say that I only watched one of mm. the show, which is Qi Yue Yu Oh, the yeah. one that won the awards, right? The Shuang Yeah, Zhu. yeah. Qi, I watched Qi Yue Yu Anshan and I watched Song Song Nanian. Song Song Nanian was god awful. <laughs> <laughs> the song was great, but the actual movie was god awful. But Qi Yue Yu Anshan, I do think it was pretty good. Mm, yeah. Do you watch any of it? Um, I didn't watch any of them, but. I have watched film reviews of them and I know Zhuo Er and Zhi Zi Huakai's directors like as yeah, yeah, yeah. the people they are and um, I don't hear really good reviews it's like very goshia sometimes yeah. goshia literally means dog blood but um like if you <laughs> refer to our C-dramas episode it's like essentially non-sensical. like nonsensical plot lines and you, repetitive cliches yeah and you introduce like weird disasters out of nowhere suddenly people have like dementia suddenly people have car crashes it's all this suddenly thing. you lose your memory you know <laughs> that's like a lot of the things that are mm. very repetitive and regurgitated mm-hmm. yeah like everyone must go through a heartbreak there must be cheating involved someone must get an abortion someone must have a mental breakdown <laughs> in a hospital yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just now you mentioned something about like childhood memories right yeah. I realised that all these shows they also have like a certain kind of like colour grading style it's very yeah. bluish whitish yeah, like, and they yeah, have this very soft lighting. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like airbrushing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The entire building to read to kind of install a sense of nostalgia in mm, the viewers. It's like dreamlike fantasy yes. to the good old days, something like that. But I, I remember something my parents said for their era, which is like for their era, which is like uh seventies, eighties. The reason why a lot of these films didn't exist also was because love as a topic was considered mi mi zhi ying. Like it's not considered like a oh, legit yeah. main melody enough. So. Uh, young generations aren't allowed to fixate so much on this kind of like feeble content yeah yeah like romance was too run of the mill and it wasn't noble enough of a cause to talk about you mm. know what we should talk about the country yeah. <laughs> the party like <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna disappear tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna knock on our door and be like open up <laughs> we need a pool here <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> okay, yeah, moving on. <laughs> moving on to the 2010s and 2020s, we start seeing a diversification in terms of the different topics that Chinese films kind of explore. Mm. So, a lot of the newer movies actually take on different genres and they are taking bigger risks mm. as compared to the older movies because I guess there's a sense of maturity in terms of the production. Mm. In the in the past, when things first started picking up, it was a lot of copying other countries, particularly Hollywood's movies, mm. like line for line, you know, mm. script by script. But then eventually you started telling your own stories from adapted novels. Mm. And then now you're moving on to inventing new stories. So mm. I feel like there's a bit of progress there. Mm. So the genre that we've seen the most growth in is actually the sci-fi genre. Mm. There's very limited and very few sci-fi works in terms of Chinese films. Mm. But it has most of them have emerged from the past few years. And the notable ones include San Ti, Liu Liang Di Chiu, and an infamous example will be Shanghai <laughs> Bao Lei or Shanghai Fortress. <laughs> Yeah, I think Santi is one of those films that have exploded recently, and mm. because it not it doesn't just call, talk about sci-fi um as a oh my god so cool technological advancement as a mm. genre, it also involves stuff like morality and how scientists should pursue their um how pursue knowledge in a way that doesn't you know ruin the rest of society and stuff like in that. an ethical way. Yeah, in an ethical way. Liu Liang Di Qiu is also a very famous one that I again never really watched, Same. but I heard very very good reviews for. Yeah, so on top of that, other recent films that we feel like are worth noting include the continuation of the Jian Guo and uh, the nation, Jian, building nation building films that we've previously mentioned. The most recent notable example includes Zhan Lang and Zhan Lang Er, which is like War Wolf, I guess is yeah. the translation. Yeah, and the Zhan Lang series is very, I think it's the highest grossing film in China uh, history as of now. Yeah, yeah, because it was like nationalism, but in a. But cool. But cool. <laughs> make, <laughs> Essentially, it's a ripoff of like Captain America. Okay, don't don't come for me of the, come for me for this. It's not a superhero film, but it is very much the same idea of the individualist saving the world hero. Like mm, I am going to that do trope the, la. that trope, and it is very much that kind of movie. It is like I am single candidly going to save all of us. Another movie was the founding of an army in twenty seventeen, and this film actually featured a lot of very young Chinese pop singers that were mm. already very well known and very popular in the industry, mm. including Li Yifeng, Liu Haoran, and Lei Zhang. So the guy from XOL, Zhang Yixing. Yes, yeah. correct. So you can see that the Chinese government is still trying to push their patriotic and nationalistic uh, narrative, but they are trying to keep up with the times mm. by throwing in your favorite idols. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
who might not actually understand what the film is about. We will talk about that later. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and in addition to that, we also see uh, the profitability and wide acceptability of comedy films which have boasted their popularity even more. So especially good for Chinese New Year. So Chinese New Year is a period where there's a... Sh- I was going to say shit ton, but actually yeah, there's a shit ton of movies coming out. It's called 贺岁片, which means you celebrate a new year with It's the kind film. of like summer blockbusters. Like oh, it is yeah. the time where a lot of people start going to the cinemas mm. because they have, yeah. you know, holidays. And a feature of 贺岁片 is they tend to be very family friendly and very funny. Yeah, and I remember... Uh, a few of them that I watched that I really really like. There's one called Detective Chinatown, Tang Ren Jie Tan An, and actually was so successful that there were and three movies for it. And the cool thing about Tang Ren Jie Tan An is actually it's not set in China. It actually brings China to a global stage, or rather, it puts Chinese characters to navigate. Uh, I think New York, Thailand, and some other country. I, I can't remember. remember. I mean, New York's not a country. I mean, USA. But yeah, and I really like the show because. It proved to me that Chinese screenwriters can write for a film. <laughs> like the the mystery is actually indeed quite mysterious, for the lack of a better word. And there were very good logical reasonings being dished out throughout the film. And I think the CGI was quite cool. Like for yeah, I was for a Chinese like, production. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, there was one scene where okay, so the main character he's a genius, so he can literally map out the entire map of like New York just by like, looking at one small thing. And then the CGI really just like unfolded everything and like superimposed a lot of different maps on top. Oh, wow, that one was really really cool. Yeah, I really like this series a lot. So another counterpart to the Tang Tan series is the Tai Zhong series, and it's called it's called Lost in Thailand, and it has a very very high profile cast, including Fan Bingbing, who's now cancelled, Huang Bo, Wang Baoqiang, and Tao Hong, and these people are, um, I would say actors that everybody in China would know, regardless of your age. And the Taoyan Xu Zheng, who's actually also a very famous Taoyan in China, or a director in China. Um, I personally didn't really like the film because it's like, I feel like it's a bit like Stephen Chow, Zhou Xingqi's humor, but delivered weirdly. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is happening? It's like, people just like, and co- cover entirely in mud. I mean, Jiong literally means like, you are in a very awkward situation and you look terrible. La. So the entire show was a bit like nonsensical in that aspect, but it was marketed as a a funny film for families to enjoy. Yeah, and moving on from there, there's also a very cool collection of, uh, I would say, Xie Xing. Um, it's a- Comedy actors? Yeah, yeah. So, it's called Kai Xing Mahua, and actually Kai Xing Mahua operates as a theatrical troupe, and they have appeared on the Spring Festival Gala quite a lot. And some of their notable actors are Shen Teng, Ma Li, Chang Yuan, and Ai Lun. But... Um, they don't just act on the stage. They have also started to produce a few film, a few films. Yeah, and I remember one of them was Xi Hong Shi Shou Fu, and the you know the theme song was the Then Show Oh God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the yeah that <laughs> that was the year everybody was like oh that song, but yeah they are actually legitimately funny people, and I think they are currently a house brand. It's like NTUC, but. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you mean a household name. <laughs> House brand. <laughs> so the last CG film I'm going to talk about is Li Hao Li Huan Ying, also known as Hello Mom or Hi Mom, because Li Huan Ying is the female lead's mom. Yeah, and this show, this film is a love letter from director Jia Ling to her mom who actually passed away. And this film was actually so um so successful that it's the second highest grossing film in Chinese film history right after Zhan Lang Er. And it was also the fastest grossing film in Chinese history to hit 5 billion piao fang. It's piao fang. Box office. Yes, box office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, this is one of the Chinese films I've watched recently that really, 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 really touched my heart because Jia Ling actually, she's a comedian. But I feel like behind every good comedic actress, there's always like Bei Qing the you know, there's always like a sorrowful aspect that they are drawing energy and inspiration from. And the reason why this show is so touching is because, okay, like, I mean, having a mom is not really universal, but like 99.99% of the world probably has an experience like that. And it touches on stuff like, you know, regrets growing up, happiness, childhood, family. And, you know, these are things that if you watch as a family, you can probably like really feel it. And um, this film also is a testament of Jia Ling and Zhang Xiaofei's friendship. So Zhang Xiaofei is a female actress. Uh, who acted as Jia Ling's mom in the show. And so it's basically a 双女主 kind of show, but it's like mom and daughter. And 
their genuine friendship over the years has really like um it really made this film I feel like yeah in the interviews later on and in like the award ceremonies they attended because this film really was um so successful it, you can really see them being genuinely happy for each other when like the other person steps onto stage to receive an award and that just really um enhances the kind of love that fans would feel for this film yeah so it's like Siju but it will make you cry. It's like sell the sell the to cool the cool the cool the to sell that kind of feeling. We want to insert a disclaimer here that by no means are we going to be able to cover every single movie ever produced in China, mm. nor are we going to be able to address all the good movies. But we want to bring up some notable ones. This is supposed to be an introduction or a crash course to Chinese films. By no means is it like a comprehensive encyclopedia. Mm. Hopefully, it will pique your interest with some of the works that we mentioned. But mm. again, if you enjoy some of the films that are not mentioned today, please don't be disheartened. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Hope so, you're interested in our spicy opinions. <laughs> Moving on to some famous directors that mm. we mentioned really gained their fame and notoriety in the early 1990s. The first one would be Feng Xiaogang, who directed Tang Shan Da Di Zheng and Fei Cheng Wu Rao. Mm. So Tang Shan Da Di Zheng is actually a real historical event that happened in China. Mm. It was talking about the natural natural disaster that occurred in China, Tang Shan, where there was a earthquake, I think, of like 7.0 something okay, or 8.0, almost, mm. almost 8.0 magnitude, and it killed, I think, hundreds of thousands of people and destroyed approximately 70% of the buildings like destroyed meaning coll total collapse like catastrophic event basically. yeah it was a very catastrophic event for china and um the movie really captures again we didn't watch this <laughs> Do you no, watch I, I watched i watched oh my God. It. Okay, I, okay. I literally only watched one snippet and i cried so bad it yeah. was okay so okay the film is very great as you can probably expect but the reason why i think this film really really hit people in the heart is because it it, it revolves around the main character who is acted as a acted by a very talented child actress zhang xiaofeng Zhang Zifeng. Uh, Zhang Zifeng, sorry. Back then she was like only nine years old. But so the film, uh, the scene is all the buildings have toppled around her and her mom chose to save her brother and not her. Oh, damn. Yeah. And then she finally gets out of the rubble. She's entirely like disheveled and she's like very, very depressed. And it's just one small girl in like... Oh, oh my God. Okay, that sounds very sad. Yeah, and I, I literally only watched that scene and I cried. And... Wow, I, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, that's a very notable director with some of his notable works. Mm. Another one would be Chen Kai Ge, who directed Ba Wang Bie Ji or Farewell My Concubine, mm. Zhao Shi Guo, and Yao Mao Zhuan. Mm. So of course, he directed more, um, mm. including Wu Ji, which is a very, very bad film. I, I heard that too. Everyone, like, really hated that film. I would say that Chen Kai Ge has a godlike existence in the Chinese directors, <laughs> amongst Chinese directors, for Farewell My Concubine. Mm, mm. A lot of people said that Farewell My Concubine was his best work and everything other than that was garbage. Xiang Lan Cai Jing. Xiang Lan Cai Jing means you talented one time then after that GG. Yeah. <laughs> but I really, personally, Farewell My Concubine is my all-time favourite Chinese film. And it's one of my all-time favourite films, period. So I do really think that he has a lot of talent, but I don't know where a lot of the talent... Like, he fluctuates so much yeah, that I, I agree. don't think he's a very reliable director. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like he put all his chi into like one thing <laughs> and after that he cannot tahan anymore. I don't know. I, I think Yao Mao Zhang was interesting to watch because of the CGI. The storyline was like in between spirituality and historical elements. But the CGI was cool. <laughs> yeah. I think Yao Mao Zhang was a very beautiful and aesthetic film to mm. watch. Yeah. But the actual plot and the um qual kind of weird. overall quality of the film is lacking in some other aspects. Let's just put it this way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the very one of the most famous Chinese directors is Wang Ka Wei or mm. Wang Jia Wei. Mm. I have yet to watch a single Wang Jia Wei film because I need to watch all of them at one go. So like, don't come oh, after me. Like, <laughs> but I really um think he is one of the most famous names for a good reason because he has a very unique aesthetic and style when he approach filmmaking and some of his very famous works include Dong Xie Xi Du, Ashes of Time, Chongqing Senling, Chongqing Express, Itai Zhong Shi, The Grandmaster, and I guess the most famous one would be Hua Yang Nian Hua or In the Mood for Love. If you've ever seen a screenshot of two of a guy and a lady standing in an alleyway and the lady is wearing a very tight tea power with like <sighs> blue and red lighting, mm. that is from In the Mood for Love. It mm. is like one of the most aesthetic films of all time. People study this movie in 
like film school for aestheticism and cinematography because he has such a unique style and I just think that um, if you are interested in Chinese films, you should definitely check him out. Hmm. I think In Tai Zong Shi is also well known because of the Kung Fu scenes and yeah. the... It's just very action-packed. Okay, given the context where he filmed it back then, it wasn't like so technologically advanced, mm. but he managed to deliver a very compelling storyline and a power struggle. And it's kind of like an underdog story also. You watch it? Yeah. Oh my god, I haven't watched it. I feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I won't watch it, okay? Another director that we mm. like to mention is, again, an international name, Li An or Ang Li. Mm. So you might know him from more English films, including The Life of Pi. Mm. That's the only film I can remember. <laughs> That's the only film I can remember that is like... But he, he does a lot of Hollywood films. Somehow. He does a lot of Hollywood yeah. films. Uh, he's a Taiwanese director. Mm. But we're going to include this because um, he also works with a lot of mainland actors. Mm. So two of the most famous Chinese films that he has are Huo Hu Changlong, which is Crouching Tigers, Hidden Dragons, mm. I watched recently. Mm. Absolutely amazing. Mm. And uh, Se Jie, or Last Caution. Mm. So Last Caution is again very famous, but I think because it was quite explicit, yeah. so a lot of people have divided opinions. Mm. But um, Crouching Tigers, Hidden Dragons is really a landmark Chinese film because mm. it, I think it was the first Chinese film to win the Oscar for Best foreign language film mm. and it really inspired a lot more movies to come not just for Chinese films but also for Hollywood because of the amazing action sequences so it's a it's a kung fu film all the special effects the physical fighting the choreography and the filming was cinematography was really really top notch mm -hmm. so if you and it has Michelle Yeoh like need I say Michelle more Michelle Yeoh yeah so if you if you want to watch one movie <sighs> for all of today, I think it's hidden type uh, crouching tigers, hidden dragons. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think one amazing thing about this film, as well as um other films within this era that really propelled Chinese films to inter international fame, is that people who only consume Hollywood versions of what China is like understand that China is not just bamboo font and <laughs> people with exaggerated makeup and broken English. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, that, I think that was a very important hallmark period for film history in general. Yeah. Mm. The last famous director on our th famous director's list is Zhang Yimou, mm. who is very famous for his aesthetics. Mm. I would say that like most people know him for his very, very beautiful shots. So some of his famous films include Qiu Ju Da Guan Si, Huo Zhe, Hong Gao Liang, Man Chen Jing Dai Huang Jing Jia, Da Hong Deng Long Gao Gao Gua, Wo De Fu Qing Wu Qing, Shi Mian Mai Fu, or House of Flying Daggers and Jingling Shi San Chai. So he's been known to be labelled as someone who values style over substance. Like a lot mm. of people criticise his works for lacking in substance and lacking in plot, but visually being very stunning. Mm. So I kind of agree because a lot, I have to, like no one can deny that his films visually look absolutely impeccable, but you kind of cannot avoid looking at the plot and saying, what did I just watch? I feel like I consumed... It's like empty <laughs> calories, you know? Like you... Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that for Jing Ling Shi San Chai, though. That one was... Wow. I don't think it was the best movie. I think it made an impact because it was so traumatising. Uh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Okay, I feel like his films are emotionally very riveting, but plot-wise, it doesn't move very much. Like, you... It's like empty calories. You learn, you watch the movie and you're like, what did I learn? Nothing. Wow. You know how like good movies make you think and evoke certain emotions in you and it kind of sits with you for a while? His movies don't really do that for me personally. Am I going to get cancelled? I don't, I don't think know. so. A lot of people... I, I disagree with you but I wouldn't cancel you lah. I don't, <laughs> I don't think he is that widely loved. He mm. is a very, very famous... He's a problematic human being. He is? What did he do? Um... He, he had a lot of children um, back when China didn't really allow it. So he had a lot of like, underground children. Yeah, but I'm not sure whether this so is So Jackie Chan. Sport. Jackie Chan is also a very famous. Uh, like Jackie famous. Chan is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that a lot of the famous directors we mentioned thus far are all male, yes. unfortunately. And unfortunately, the film industry is still quite a male-dominated industry. But we just want to mention some of the female directors. Okay, so firstly, I have to apologize. Just like Cao Jingnan has been apologizing the whole episode. I didn't watch their, all of their films. I only know of these female directors because they have floated to my radar or they appeared on variety shows and people have, uh, people within the industry have mentioned them as names that inspired them to enter the industry. So the first director is Zhao Wei and she actually gained fame in China due to acting in Huan Zhu Ge Ge. 
and she was a very famous actress and then she became a businesswoman and then she started directing her own films and one of them was Chuomen which is once again like a Chinchun Teng Tong Wenxue film like Teenage Angst and stuff like that. And actually it was her graduating piece for when she did her masters in uh, film directing. Yeah, and actually it was quite a it won like two or three awards or so. Yeah, but I didn't watch it, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but from what I've seen of Zhao Wei appearing on film directing variety shows, I feel like she's a very um She's like emotional but also logical at the same time. She's a very good blend of those things and she's very good at finding out what what exactly will shine on a certain actor and cast them as such. Yeah, there were a lot of examples on variety shows. You can check them out on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, another person who's very famous is Li Shaohong and her um, reputation within the industry is Zhongguo最任性的女导演 which means um, she the doesn't really... The most willful director yeah, in like, China. Yeah, she doesn't really um, give a shit about what other people say and she'll just cast whatever she wants. Uh, whoever she wants and I think her most famous work is Da Ming Gong Ci and from her cinema her cinematography is very unique in that she uses a lot of like shots of people in close intimacy with each other and then she will zoom out and then the background is always like something that tells a bigger story but what I know her from most is she uh, did a re-adaptation of Sing Ho Lo Meng so Ho Lo Meng is the Dreams of Red Chambers which is one of the for most no- famous novels, novels yeah. in China. And the reason why I say re-adaptation is because there's already a very good adaptation. <laughs> so her re-adaptation wasn't actually <laughs> very good. So like, um, as you mentioned just now, like a lot of film production is like done in a faster pace nowadays. So her re-adaptation casted um, people who didn't really fully portray the characters in the show as well. But the people who appear in her film all became very famous down the road. Like Yang Yang and Li Qin and all those people are now like... I, I wouldn't say A-list. Are they, they are A-list, A-list, A-list yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like actually very famous in China nowadays. And they start off with this film. And the last person is Xu Yan Hua. And I think she's a very, very, very notable person because she's basically the only female director who has won like a ton of awards to like... Okay, it's like the Hong Kong and China equivalent of the Oscars and she has belted a lot of awards and her films, unlike the other two people who focus more on let's say like fantastical or like historical elements, her films really talk about um, the plight of women in Hong Kong and um, a lot of social issues and stuff like that. So her most notable film is Nu Ren Si Shi which revolves around this um, woman who has to deal with a lot of family issues and um, um, uh, well, let's say her f- one of her family members has Alzheimer's disease and stuff like that. And she has to f- strike a balance between work and life. So her films are very like emotionally grounded. sensitive and grounded. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So we on to some infamous directors. <laughs> so this is the time where we start talking shit. Yeah, um, let's go. <laughs> the first person on our list is this guy called Guo Jingming. <laughs> okay, Guo Jingming is actually an author. So he started off by writing the Qingchun Teng Tong Wen Xiao mm. Shuo that we mentioned. So mm. all the angsty teenage uh, high school life drama, uh, high school life novels. Mm. And this particular author actually gained a lot of fame from certain works that later on were well, discovered to discovered, be plagiarized. Yeah, and mm. actually was he was actually sued mm. and the court did rule that he plagiarized these works. Mm-hmm. So it is not just us saying he potentially plagiarized. It's it an is an open the, secret in China. Yeah. And everybody looked down on him for that. Yeah. Point. So yeah. he's famous for his movies that were adapted from the novels that he himself wrote. Mm. So the most famous one being Xiao Shi Dai. Little which, Times. Oh my gosh. It's so <laughs> I, okay, I I need to say this, which is mm. for a very long time, Xiao Shi Dai, all four books of Xiao Shi Dai were the worst books I've ever read in my entire life. And you actually read them? I read all four books. It was the worst books I've ever read. Since then, I've read even worse books, which I'm not <laughs> proud of. But the thing is, for a very long time, it held oh that it held that name. So I was, I really do not like his work because he's very self-absorbed. Mm, I don't know, mm, like mm. He, the way he writes is very, very, um, like emptily g- glamorous. It's yeah, like yeah. trying to emulate The Great Gatsby if there's absolutely no substance. Oof, it's like, basically his films also, they look like very well adorned PPT slides with no words on it. <laughs> it's like if yeah. you made Wolf of Wall Street, 
but minus any finance aspect and just left like the glitz and glamour glitz and glamour mm. so he really romanticizes like material wealth yes. and he really loves to kind of elaborate not just in his novels but also on the movie screen various types of like luxurious lifestyles mm. and luxury goods and he really paints such a romantic picture of all these high end lifestyles and high end purchases mm. and glamorizes the ultra rich to a point where it and it sends no messages across. It's just so, a meme at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like it, he was his works have always been very criticized, heavily criticized for being so materialistic. Biting. Yeah, biting. Yeah. I, and I feel like for the relationships between the characters, it's always very vacuous and also yeah. very gauche. It's like somehow they will break up because of the smallest stupidest thing, and it just becomes a huge ass misunderstanding. And then there's also stuff like um uh, people dying and coming back as a, another person, and like all these like really random ass. No, I tell sense. you, the literal like one of the main ca- male characters faked his own death and then went underwent <laughs> plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> don't scream! Don't scream! <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh, I okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay. We literally could not deal I, with I, it. I literally have goosebumps talking about it's how trash so it is. It's so bad. No, it, and it, and Here's the thing that I am the most ashamed of. Mm. I ate that shit up when I was a teenager. I, was I like, don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my Twilight phase. Except oh. people are beginning to like Twilight now. Nobody likes his works. Like, mm. nobody... Up until today, nobody likes his works. Yeah, and... Like, it worries me that Xiao Shidai series was actually so commercially successful back then. And I feel like it might be because he was using a lot of actors who look good on screen. So people like Yang Mi, Chen Xue Dong, uh, Guo Cai Jie, like these people are actually very good looking. And he painted such a, I would call it like a decadent image and people just ate it up just yeah. like you. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, Xiao Shidai was actually so notorious that it was, it was like low-key cancelled by the government, but not in a way of like banning it or something. But it was a lot of new sites in China pointed it out for like being Bai Jing, like, overly materialistic and being like vacuous. And even... Um, sources on like outside of China, like I I remember Da Xiyang, the Pacific mm-hmm. or something. Yeah, so like there are a lot of um overseas media commenting on this show and saying that it only f- it's just basically feeding like self indulgent fantasies and worse, it actually projects desires onto like basically the characters are just sex objects for you to project desires on and stuff like that. Yeah. So, it's just notorious even overseas. So it's not about like cultural differences in standards or whatever. It's just it's bad that, that is universal. <laughs> <laughs> it is universally terrible. He actually gained commercial success. Mm. So his commercial success kind of propelled his ego and he made um his follow-up films, which are Jue Ji. Jue Ji one and two was touted to be the China version of Avatar, the Blue People movie, where they use a lot of CGI and they were trying to claim to be the most technologically advanced mm. and expensive movie. They were mm. making such a big deal out of how much money they spent in, ba- in their budget for CGI, but the CGI looks god awful. <laughs> yeah, it really looks like all of them failed plastic surgery. It like, looks like if the, you, everybody's face is unnatural AM. If you face tune a particular person too much, but it's like a deep fake. It looks like a deep fake with too much face so tune. For the entire movie, two hours of its runtime, it, it was just like that. And it was very difficult to watch as a viewer. I didn't watch the entire movie, I watched snippets. Oh my god, you actually watched it? I watched snippets. No. <laughs> because of the notoriety of the movie, the cast was very high profile. So yeah. they had Fan Bingbing, mm. they had Chen Xue Tong, Chen, uh, Chen Wei Ting, and a lot of very a lot famous. of people that he used in Xiao Shidai came back. A lot of, he used a lot of very famous actors and actresses. Mm. But if you actually go and watch the movie, you can barely recognize any of them. Like yeah. you're like, oh, that is Fan Bingbing. Oh, and but Fan Bingbing was because she got cancelled, so they replaced her face. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is that like, you really barely recognize it's any terrible, of them. Yeah. And the thing is, the facial capturing technology was so stiff that you really cannot convey much emotion. Like Mm-mm. you cannot get that emotion or facial expression at all through the screen. Yeah. But yeah. honestly at the same time, I feel like the emotion the capturing of emotions isn't even important if there's no storyline. <laughs> and another person who is an infamous director is Bi Zhifei. And I would say that Bi Zhifei on a moral standpoint doesn't have a lot of the problematic issues that uh Guo Jingming has. But he's just well known for producing very bad films and one of them is called 纯洁心灵逐梦演艺圈 it means pure hearts into the Chinese showbiz and the point of this film was to comment on like 
the terrible underground happenings in the Chinese showbiz, which is, let's say, like, if you're a female actor, you might have to, like, sleep with some director in order to get a, um, get a what do you call it, a, role. a role and stuff like that. But the problem is, right, his entire show was just delivered, like, some terribly cut PPT. So, like, if Guo Jingmin is, like, vacuous content but glamorous, his is, like, question mark content and PPT style. So... <laughs> it's like there's no style, there's no substance. <laughs> yeah, and worst the, of both worlds. Yeah, and and the problem is his film actually took him like nine to ten years to film, and he put in a lot of effort into it, and he actually put in like a ton of money, so like two point five lang lang qian wu wan ren ming bi. I can't really do the conversion, but okay, let's talk about proportion. Okay, he put in X amount of money, and he only got back ten percent of it in revenue, which is like. Basically terrible, and it's called Piao Fang Zhao Dan, which is like box office got bombed lah. And it's so funny because um, okay, I don't I don't laugh at his misfortune, but <laughs> in China there's this you um, deserve. I think you he deserved it, yeah. <laughs> in China there's this award ceremony where you it, you actually can receive a golden broomstick award for being the most terrible actor. So he got a, a, a director. So he got the golden broomstick award for most terrible director, most terrible film. And stuff like that. And I remember when he appeared on this variety show where the directors themselves have to um, film a small, like, let's say like two to three minutes of a film. Short or film. Short film um, based on pre-existing films. He actually completely plagiarized the pre-existing film. And then the audience who didn't know about it were like, oh, it's very good. But he got called out by the judges who actually were very well-versed in films. And because um, Bi Zhifei himself, he's actually, uh, he actually has a, I think, master's or doctor degree in film in like one of the most renowned academies in China. He was trying to use like his academic persona to wiggle out of it. But then when he got called out, he couldn't even explain the terminology that he used. So it's a bit like, you spend so much time and effort and money into your education, into your production, but whatever you produce is just just not great. So it's god awful is actually what it is. Okay, on in fact on China's version of Rotten Tomatoes, mm. the film that we mentioned, uh Pure Hearts into the show Chinese showbiz, actually maintained the lowest score mm. on China's version of Rotten Tomatoes for years. It only got broken in 2022 by another Chinese drama even that was worse film. even worse than his. <laughs> but for a very long time, his movie was objectively the worst movie in Chinese showbiz. Yeah, I mean, that's another achievement on its own, uh, I guess. <laughs> okay, so um, the reason why a lot of these directors still can, you know, exist within the Chinese industry, entertainment industry, I think, um, points to a lot of problems within the industry and the two big problems we think exist is one, a lot of people who are within the Chinese entertainment industry, they are not like, I don't want to use the word culture and educated as a way to like look down on people who don't have certain backgrounds, but in the very least, you should understand the context of the films that you are producing. And as an actor, maybe you should, you know, understand how the characterization works and to understand what you are producing for the audience. But especially in 2022 to 2023, there's a new web slang in China called 绝望的文盲. Jie Wang means like um devastating, hopeless, and then Wen Mang means like people who are just uneducated. Illi- illiterate. Illiterate, basically, yeah. And there's another web slang called Jiu Lo Yu. This one's very funny. It's called Jiu Nian Yi Wu Jiao Yu Lo Wang Zhi Yu. So like people who fall through the cracks despite the nine years compulsory education system in China. And yeah, so one of the most uh what do you call it? The most recent examples is um a film came out uh during Chinese New Year called Man Jiang Hong. It was directed by Zhang, Zhang Yimou, Yimou. Yeah. one of the most fam- famous Chinese directors, yeah. mind you. I will talk about Zhang Yimou later because I have some things to say about him. So, Man Jiang Ho, right, it literally translates to whole river red. And uh, it, the historical context of Man Jiang Ho is actually, it tells the story of this uh, Song Dynasty general called Yue Fei. So, Song Dynasty is uh, a dynasty in historical China that was actually split into two parts, so Northern Song and Southern Song. So, a shit ton of stuff happened, including like the, the emperors themselves fighting each other, even though they are like father and son and brother. And then Northern Song got captured by external invaders called the Jurchens. I can't really pronounce this mm-hmm. word properly. But yeah, and then as part of Southern Song, right, Yue Fei did his best to like reclaim whatever was lost in Northern Song. But because of this person called Qing Hui, who is like one of the He's quoted as one of the treacherous uh, of government officials in uh, Chinese history. He was telling the emperor that UFA was serving that UFA seems like someone who's very power hungry and war hungry. So he's gonna be a threat to your throne, and you should like capture him and like you know deal with him. 
So despite being an epitome of loyalty and seen as a war hero now, um, Yue Fei was actually captured and executed, basically. Yeah, so that is the story of Man Jiang Hong. And you can see that this story is actually, like, there's a lot of, like, nationalistic sentiment to it, a lot of, like, paragon of loyalty and stuff like that. But the way Man Jiang Hong was marketed, right, was, like, so upsetting because it really showed how the production team does not really know the context very well. So the first example of how the production team is not really well versed in the kind of media they are producing is on the film's official social media account. There were a shit ton of swap so like typos of like the actual words. So for example, Nu Fa Chong Guan, which is a lyric in the Man Jiang Hong poem, right? They used the Fa Cai de Fa. Mm. They, they were using traditional Chinese characters. So back then, Fa Cai de Fa and Tou Fa de Fa were different Fa's. And they couldn't tell. <sighs> it's like, this is very basic knowledge. And then there's also um, this... Uh, a very important concept called Jing Kang Chi, which actually refers to a historical event where Northern Song was lost to the external invaders. They broke it out into Jing Kang Chi. It's like, I don't know, if, if I if I spell inside, now I want to make a pun, maybe I split in and side. I don't inside the, you know? That's like the kind of thing that they were trying to do and it was so bad. And um, they, because it was during Chinese New Year period, right, they wanted to make it like a very like cool and like um, very festive season, but at the same time, they were also like trying to say, okay, we are going to ta po shan he, but ta po shan he literally means uh, you ravage through mountains and rivers and you, it's a hostile takeover of your own country's land by the enemies, but they were using phrases like that in an auspicious period. Like they used it in a positive light. They were using it as if it was um, a positive mm -mm. description. Mm -mm. Like, we are our box office is going to ta po shan he, yeah. which makes absolutely no sense that your box office is going to be ravaged. Question mark, question mark. <laughs> yeah, and like there were a lot of other problems with this, but I think one of them that really, really, really triggered um, netizens was um, netizens were already picking up on all their typos and issues. And then they replied, mo shi yo. And mo shi yo literally means like, whatever you say is groundless and baseless. But the reason why mo shi yo is such a powerful term is because the treacherous officer, Qin Hui, he used this term to rebut whatever Yue Fei wanted to say when he pledged his loyalty to Salmon Song. So it's like, basically, the production team was just trying to use catchphrases and symbolisms that were pertinent in the movie, but in a way that made them seem like they were siding with the whatever was coded evil within the show. And it just showed that they were not aware of the kind of message they were like sending across. Yeah, and okay, so on the point of Zhang Yimou, right? So, you know, just now we mentioned like a bit of Jiang Lang Cai Jing, which means that like, you might produce something very, very good, but in recent years, or like in your later years, you maybe run out of creativity and stuff like that. Um, I remember for Man Jiang Hong, in response to the issues with Man Jiang Hong, right, he, during the interview, he spent like 10 plus minutes talking about how he wants to yi jing dao di. Do you see? I didn't see. Okay, okay. So yi jing dao di means you take one thing for the yeah. entire film. And then he spent 10 whole minutes talking about how he wants to do a one take to shoot the entire film. And that was literally his entire response to why the film was bad. Because I had I had a dream to do this. Wow, it's a very big dream. Can you believe how difficult it might be? But wow, that was my dream. Like I am so cool for thinking about that. But I couldn't have done it. Like he just spent 10 whole minutes on that. And like, so now now he's part of the dream. <laughs> but it's it's so it's so weird because like it feels that he really has nothing to say to defend himself. And at the same time, he also was known recent in recent years for using this Mo Nilang called Liu Hao Chun. Have mm -hmm. you heard of her? No. Oh, okay, okay. So, you know, just like I mentioned, a lot of Mo Nilang who really like made it to stardom and they've been still producing very good films nowadays. But Liu Hao Chun is, like I mentioned just now, like one of the vacuous flower vases. And like Zhang Yimou's um, treatment of her was like, it's almost like she's being a very nice father figure to her like if she cannot act he'll be like no it's okay don't worry but the the Mo Lungs in the past really had to go through like grueling training and they were already held to a very very high standards even if they didn't have acting experience in the past so I'm not really sure what's going on with Zhang Yimou nowadays but yeah and it's it's kind of like I think Liu Haochun's existence is also um it's very like it, it's a testament of how people with, with no substance now can gain a lot of fame and they have a lot of resources to be like start in high profile films. But during the interview, right, when someone asked her like what does what's an actor, what does an actor do? And then she really had nothing to say. 
And then after she paused for a very long time, she's like, uh, can we not show this on screen? But it's like a live interview. It's oh so my like, god. She's so like, can you put it in? Yeah. And then uh, there was another interview where um, the interviewer asked her, Do you think you're a talented actor? Do you think you're a talented actor? And then she was like, Why not? She was like, yeah, why not? Like, why, why aren't I? <laughs> like, of course, like, it's very really like, she really has no self-awareness because like, everybody around her somehow is just babying her in this industry and she just has a lot of resources and we don't know why. So talking about celebrities that honestly are empty-headed, like, <sighs> head empty, no thoughts kind of energy, another very famous recent example is the movie Wu Ming. So in this movie, a very popular idol actor, he's known as Wang Yibo. If mm. you know The Untamed, then you will know he's the one that um, Lan is Lan Wangzi in, in white and blue. Mm. So he's very, very famous as an individual. Like He's like an idol slash actor slash he dances and mm. I think he also sings. But mm. the thing is, he's one of those people that are famous but not really talented. Yeah, okay, don't please don't come for me. But okay, wait, the caveat is I think he's talented in dancing, but he's branching out into areas that he's really not good at now. Yeah. Yeah, so he was playing a very significant role in this movie, and this is a movie that had a lot of very famous casts, mm. like I, I, a lot of other very famous actors in it. So the netizen started making fun of him for how quote unquote illiterate and uncultured he was mm. because of the interviews that he was in. So during the interview, some of some of the reporters asked him, so if you time travel back, what would you say to the character that you're playing? And then he literally answered, oh, time travel is not real, so there's no point in answering this question. What is the... <laughs> Whoa, okay, then... What a way to say, I don't know how to answer. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, the next question is, um, they asked him, what do you feel like your character represents or like how do you want to comment on you, your character in the film? Like mm. how will you summarize your character? Mm. And he literally straight out just say, I don't know how to answer this question. And he just looked at the director, expecting the director to help him answer the question. Like, if, <sighs> like people are really saying that they are illiterate and uncultured for a reason. Mm. I understand that it is okay for a lot of actors or actresses to not have very good formal education mm, mm, because mm. they spend a lot of their younger years on screen mm. and you know within sets mm. so they may not have like, a university degree or whatever mm. but the thing is it's not about us judging them based off the formal education it is about us as audiences judging you for not putting in a professionalism to do the basic research to understand sure. who your character is what they stand for what is the context of the media that you're producing mm. and all of these nuances that really contribute towards your performance as an actor when you don't even bother to do the basic research and homework and you can't even bother to answer these very basic questions then what is the point you know <laughs> yeah and it, it's just very sad that like i mean i wouldn't say sad but it's a bit infuriating that he gets so many resources and as thing i mentioned just now he gets to start alongside very famous people like zhang yi who's well known for being someone who really digs deep into his character and he portrays like really intense emotions like he gets the opportunity to learn from all these like seniors within the industry but it seems like his experience has done nothing for his personal growth and i think it's very irresponsible as someone who's portraying a character and i think for this film in uh in particular this character has to go through it a, a f different decades and there are a lot of very complex situations going on within the film so the fact that he really has nothing to say about the character says a lot about him as an actor and him uh, as an individual like yeah. how much he is willing to put in how much effort he is putting in into his job essentially yeah but at the same time i'm wondering like does he actually like acting or is, is his company just forcing him to do whatever can give him the highest profile nowadays but even if you don't like what you're doing you're getting paid you owe it to you the audience at least do something to about... do your best mm, you know yeah. like it is one thing to be limited by your talent it is another thing to not even bother and try attitude versus attitude la, yeah honestly, honestly. Yeah. so okay so just now uh, Jingna mentioned the director right so the director's name is Cheng Er and I would say that he really has to <laughs> go through a lot of shit to like I feel like during interviews he's really trying his best to pretend like he's happy about the casting of Wang Yibo. Like, I can see him answering questions for him all the time and it's just, like, very painful to watch. But at the same time, right, I feel like he's in a very awkward position because Wu Ming, right, is a very interesting phenomenon where people don't really know whether the film is good or not. I haven't watched it myself, so I cannot comment. But what I can comment on is the very interesting roundabout way the director tried to make sure that 
um, the film has good ratings. So um, in China, there are a few different websites that are equivalents of like IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes and stuff like that. So there's Chihu and Douban. So basically, the Cheng Er director, right, he was trying to make sure that the audience rates his film highly. So he will say stuff like, oh, I believe in the taste of all my audience and I believe that you will, you know, rate the film as best as you think it will be and all that like nice, nice PR stuff. He's just manipulating the audience into giving him high ratings. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, right, he didn't get high ratings across multiple websites. So here's the thing. So let's say the Zhuhu audience don't rate the film very high or as high as he thinks it should be. Then he will go on to Douban and then he will like ask the Douban audience to like, you know, say the same thing again. So he just basically went to like a few different websites and like it's almost like his film has no home. It's like a homeless film <laughs> because none of the ratings are satisfactory for him. So I feel like it's a bit like Chisiang Nang Kan, which is like Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. is like um the way you look when you're eating and in this case we're talking about like eating money basically. So like you create a film and like you reap the profits for it and, and then at the same time you're not happy with the way uh, people respond to your film. Even though, like, even though he said he respects his audience and he he really welcomes their genuine thoughts, but at the same time he's like, oh, your genuine thought is not nice enough for me. It's very hypocritical, uh, yeah, like, yeah. For you to be like, oh, I appreciate all forms of criticism mm. and your genuine response and feedback, and then at the same time you're like, actually, you guys, like, whatever you say is wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it started this um entire trending uh hashtag on Weibo. So Weibo has this like trending hashtag rankings, and then during the the Wu Ming uh period of time, right? There's a ranking called uh Wu Ming Yo Guan Kan Meng Kan Ma. So Guan Kan Meng Kan is like is there a barrier and of for to entry to be able to appreciate the film? So from the audience POV. So like I feel like the barrier to entry will include stuff like cultural knowledge to appreciate the film. Uh, the social historical context, cinematographic techniques and stuff like that. And basically, people were on two sides of the argument. Some were saying, oh, this is a really good film. You just have to like, put your heart to it. You have to think hard enough. But other people were like, why must a film only be good if I really like try very, very hard to understand it? Yeah. Like, shouldn't it be presented to me in a way that I can digest it even if like, I'm not a super I had no prior audience. knowledge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, if your storytelling is good enough, you should be able to know what's happening. It's like, if your, if your movie has like three parts to it and someone watches part two first, they should still be able to understand some context of what the premise of the world is Yeah, from the first few minutes of the show, uh, of the film. So, yeah. yeah. On, on that point, right, I agree with the camp that's like, it. you shouldn't have a barrier to entry for things like films mm. because the whole point of films is to tell a good story mm. and the, to tell a good story, you shouldn't have to study beforehand in order for <laughs> you to enjoy a film, is my point of view. Mm. Like, it really doesn't make sense. Why should I be an expert on all of World War II if I just want to enjoy a war film? No. If you want to tell a good story, it should be accessible to all audiences. There should not be a barrier to entry. You are just being pretentious and snobby and resisting criticism if you are telling and manipulating and gaslighting your audience into believing that they are somehow not good enough to enjoy mm. your film. It just looks bad on you as a filmmaker. Yeah, and I think it's very ironic because the whole reason why films and cinematography got popular was because it actually made like dense text more accessible to an audience yeah. because of the visual and later on auditory aspects. Yeah. So you saying that you have to go back, like you're basically backtracking through like media history to say that to understand your film, you must understand the entire text yourself. Something Doesn't like make that. sense. Yeah. So on the note of Chinese films, there have been quite a few film-related variety shows nowadays that highlight the directors and the actors who go into film productions to so that the audience can put a face on the people who are involved in the industry. So two of them notably are Yan Yuan Qing Jiu Wei and uh, Dao Yan Qing Zhi Jiao. For Yan Yuan Qing Jiu Wei, um, there are four directors who act as uh, mentors and then uh, actors come in and they get chosen by the mentors and then they will film short films together. For a show that's named Actors Please Stand in Place, which supposed, is supposed to focus on actors as well as the art of filmmaking, the hottest topics that emerged out of the show was actually the criticism and the dissing between different guest directors that mm. acted as mentors that you mentioned. Mm. So at the end of the day, the reason why it became such a hot topic was because you rarely see directors in front of the screen. Usually mm. directors are behind the screen. Mm. And a lot of it was very juicy, like gossip. Like yeah. they really just criticized each other's work mm. in front of each other. And it was it was like 
very shady. Yeah. So a lot of the audiences were very excited by that. And they it was also the first time that they got to see directors express themselves mm. and their own thoughts and opinions outside of just judging them from the film. Mm. So you can really see people like Guo Jingming get really hated on because um his opinions were like he was trying to play the victim mm. and a lot of people just really didn't like his personality. Mm. So if you are a director and you're exclusively behind the screen and people people can only criticize your movie. Now that you're on the screen and you're on air talking, people can really take a better look at you and criticize you as an individual. Yeah. So yeah. I think this variety shows have propelled directors to also celebrity status and now they are being um Oh, what's the word for it? They're being judged the way people would judge a celebrity and like yeah. into all aspects of their lives. So um, on one hand, they are given the spotlight. On the other hand, um, it also removes the artistic creation aspect of them from the public eye sometimes, which I feel like it's a bit... Um, it kind of reverses the entire point of the show. Yeah, and then another one is called Dao Yan Qing Zhi Jiao. And this one was very interesting because um, the judges are not only the the other directors on the panel themselves, but also there were film commentators and they got the general public in. And then there were a lot of debates once again on whether there should be a barrier to entry for film appreciation. And I felt like this variety show, it was, um, it actually dug out quite a few very, um, quite a few budding directors who don't get the spotlight a lot, but um, they really impressed me. And I remember one of them was Wang Yichun. She, um, just now you mentioned the Sing Da Hua Si Yo, right? The mm-hmm. one with like the, the I need Yiwan Nian and like the teardrop and everything. Yeah, so she managed to re-adapt that film and she actually got two young actors who actually didn't grow up watching the old version of the film. But she created an entirely different premise for it. Um, it was modern era and then it was like a tourist get goes onto a cosplay set for Da Hua Si Yo mm-hmm. and she creates an entire story for that and it was just like very touching and yeah, she's someone that I would have never known if I never watched the variety show. Of course, there was Pi Fei on the show, which is where she got he got called out for using academic terms that he couldn't understand. And then um, the last person I thought was very interesting was Wang Wenye. And actually in China, there are quite a few mm, companies that are like media giants, basically. And Wang Wenye is actually the daughter of Hua Yi's CEO. And literally, she appeared on a film, uh, appeared on the show, not because she has directed anything, but because of the power of money backing her up. So Essentially, she's a nepo baby. <laughs> nepo baby. Oh my god! Yeah, you're right. So, yeah, like these variety shows actually shed a lot of light on what goes on within the entertainment industry and the kind of things that, uh, people prioritize when it comes to production. So, yeah, I think it's quite eye opening, but at the same time, it just alerts you to a lot of the problems within the industry for China. Mm. Talking about the power of capitalism and mm. like essentially the power of capital in the Chinese entertainment industry, mm. another reason why people feel like Chinese movies have been so terrible is because they have been focusing on paying the actors and actresses instead of paying like other aspects of the film, including mm. the props, including the set, as well as Better costumes, CGI. CGI, all that kind of stuff. Mm. For one of the worst Chinese movies to date, also known as Shanghai Fortress, a sci-fi movie that we mentioned briefly just now, for a budget of 400 million yuan, it was rumoured that Lu Han's salary was between 79 million to 120 million. Although the director did clarify that it was much lower than that, it's the idea that, can you imagine if one quarter of your entire film budget is just pay for one actor? And it's not even that he's a good actor, it's just that he's a popular yeah. idol. Yeah. yeah, so again, um, when you spend so much money on the actors and actresses who are not even that good to begin with, mm. you have to sacrifice your budget on other things, including paying scriptwriters. Mm. So in China, the phenomenon in the Chinese entertainment industry is that scriptwriters have very limited say in the production, they are, they are not as you know powerful as the directors mm. neither are they as powerful as the investors mm. and sometimes they're even less powerful than the actors themselves like yeah. if I'm a very very famous actor even though I can't act I can demand more screen time mm. I can demand to change my lines or even change my character like I mm. want to be more likable mm. I want to be more cute instead of evil or whatever mm. Mm. and even if it doesn't make sense in the story because the investors who invested want me to be in the show the scriptwriters are forced to make changes that in the end are out of character or make no sense so when scriptwriters are underpaid and overworked and for good scriptwriters are hard to come by, when you consider all of these factors, it is really very hard to make a good Chinese production mm. and Chinese film. Mm. And I know that for some films, sometimes the producer, director and scriptwriter is the same person. So they just have like too much concentrated power yeah. and 
if they themselves don't have enough substance to produce a good story, then it's just really just going down the drain. Yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, movies are stories. And if you don't have a good story to tell, it doesn't matter how good your acting is or how phenomenal the visual looks, it really fails as an art form because you fail to deliver a good message or you fail to deliver a good story. Mm. If you clicked on this video, I guess you're either interested in Chinese films or you're interested in films in general. And if that's the case, it is very important for you to know this very increasingly important phenomenon that's happening in movie productions all over the world, especially Hollywood, where producers are catering and pandering to the Chinese audience, specifically the Chinese government, in order to squeeze their films into the Chinese um, audience and market. Mm. So what is happening is that due to the sheer population of China and as well as the economic GDP and growth, the Chinese box office market has actually outgrown Hollywood and every other market in the world to be the largest box office market in the world. Mm. For China, there's an import quota of 20 Hollywood films and 14 commercial films every single year. Mm. So imagine all the movies you watch, right? Out of like 100 movies that you see every single year, only 20 can make it into the Chinese market. Mm. So as you can tell, it is very competitive. Due to this competitive nature, the Chinese government will obviously f filter and select whichever movies they feel like are the best or they like the best. Mm. This results in a lot of modern day Hollywood blockbusters pandering to Chinese audience, specifically the Chinese government. So this can include things like product placement. So in the Transformers Age of Extinction, Mark Wahlberg's character withdraws money from a China construction bank ATM while in Texas. What are the chances of there being a Chinese bank ATM in Texas? Yeah. <laughs> and a character buys a Chinese brand protein powder in a Chicago convenience store. I'm not saying it's not possible, but mm. I'm saying what are the odds, right? On top of that, before a film can be shown in China, it must first get over Chinese government censors. And Chinese government has been quick to punish studios that take on topics it doesn't want the Chinese public to see or it feels like will make China look bad. Mm. So obviously, no studio in Hollywood today would touch a movie that concerns anything involving sensitive topics like Xinjiang or Taiwan independence or demonstrations in Hong Kong mm. because it simply will hurt box office if, if they are not able to be released in China. Mm. So on top of that, there's a literal list of rules that censors in Beijing use as something of a checklist. So in 2006, Mission Impossible 3 filmed some scenes in Shanghai that featured Tom Cruise running through the streets and in the background, there's some laundry drying on like clotheslines from apartment buildings and Chinese authorities requested that the laundry be edited out of the frame because it thought it presented an image of China that was more backwards than what they wanted the world to see. So like, how insecure are you that you are ashamed exactly. of your own country's like laundry on a clothesline? Exactly. Are you serious? Like, this is okay. like the don't air your own dirty laundry. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, it doesn't make sense if you want to create a very immersive world for the audience, you want to create, uh, it includes small details like that that show that there are signs of life of people who live in this setting, right? But China is just trying to create a very pristine image of modern China that apparently shows extremely clean streets and extremely clean everything like, living arrangements even yeah. within the domestic sphere. But if you go to China, that is totally not how China looks like. Also. Yeah, so if you look at a lot of the movies that you will begin to realize that, hey, a lot of it is set in China even though it doesn't need to be. Mm. So it doesn't serve the plot in any way, but it will feature scenes from um, like set in China or it will feature Chinese brands. Mm. So like, uh, that is again product placement. If you watch Shang-Chi, right, in one of the most <laughs> epic fight sequences, they, was, they were in a kind of building that was being in construction and the backdrop, in the backdrop, there was a giant screen that was just two characters, Jing Tong, which is like, um, Chinese Amazon, like <laughs> wow, like I'm China's China. Amazon. Yeah, so did they have a dog also? Yeah, I think it had the <laughs> mascot of the brand. Like, how much money did they spend to put it in a Marvel movie to just have it be in the background? Like, it doesn't need to be there. You know what I'm trying mm. to say? It doesn't add to the plot. It doesn't serve the characters. It doesn't make any sense. Marvel Studios chose to do it because, first of all, it's additional money from a Chinese corporation. Second mm. of all, it looks good on the Chinese government. Mm. So it's like, look how international we are and yeah. stuff. Like, I think that um, scene was set in Macau, but that kind of makes sense because the entire yes. movie mm. was set partially in China. Talking about Marvel Studios, another thing that, uh, another creative decision they took due to pandering to Chinese audience was in Doctor Strange, Oh. The Tilda Swinton's <laughs> character was actually supposed to be a Tibetan individual, mm. but because Tibet is a very 
in sensitive topic for mm. Chinese government, they changed the character to be a white lady instead of a dependent Asian man. Mm. So again, a lot of people will say, oh, this is whitewashing Hollywood, how dare you? But it is deeper than that. Of course, there's an aspect of whitewashing, but also it is because Marvel wanted to make money in China. And it was because it makes such a big difference mm. being able to show your movies in China. So they are really profit driven and a lot of the creative decisions have been sacrificed in order to make sure that they can get into the China's market. Mm. So moving on to censorship, like we mentioned, a lot of the um, a lot of the movies, both in Hollywood as well as Chinese produ produced films, have to pass a certain set of rules and censors before they can be broadcasted in China. So here are some rules that we personally find very interesting. Um, firstly, you cannot distort Chinese civilization and history. Again, distort is a very subjective term. So a lot of autobiographical uh, films have to paint certain cultural heroes or historical heroes in a positive light. Mm. Otherwise, it will be considered as distorting. Mm. And another one which is will be disparaging the image of the People's Army, Armed Police, Public Security or Judiciary. So for example, something like Fast and Furious, where you're rooting for people who are robbing the cars, will never be in China because it paints the police as like in a negative light because they're incapable of stopping the criminals and you shouldn't be rooting for criminals in the first place. Yeah, and corruption is pretty much off the table because you can't have bad cops. Mm. Can you imagine a show without bad cops like in Hollywood? Like it would really destroy half the <laughs> half the productions. Yeah. So other things include like showing obscene and vulgar content, promiscuity, rape, prostitution, homosexuality, masturbation mm. and private body parts. So so this is something that's very interesting. If you are in a lot of countries like Singapore or the US, there's a rating system. Mm. So there's something called PG, PG-13. For Singapore, it's NC-16, M-18, and R-21. Mm. China doesn't have any rating system, which is very interesting because then it means that all movies are technically suitable for children. In order for all movies to be set suitable for children, can you imagine the amount of censors people have to go through? So yeah, it is... On one hand... Okay, in general, I don't think it makes any sense because yeah. it really limits and restricts the creativity that filmmakers are allowed to do because mm. you have to some people want to make more mature content and some topics are inherently much heavier than others mm. it doesn't make sense for every single film to be child friendly yeah yeah I agree, but is there a reason for not having sentence? I don't remember. I have, I have, I didn't know about this in the first place, yeah. but yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I actually watched some really disturbing movies because my family went, like, in back in China. Yeah. I, I, I did not understand the show at all. Like, it was just blood everywhere. Like, I did not <laughs> understand the show at all. Okay, so moving on, there are also, like, contents that show murder, violence, terror, ghosts, and the supernatural are not allowed to be shown. Actually, this is a whole list of things that should be censored. Also things that distort the value judgment between truth and lies. But of course, if you're talking about historical truths, then whoever wins is the person who holds the truth. So yeah. that's very subjective at the same time. Also stuff like good and evil, beauty and ugliness, righteousness and the unrighteous. Like this have to be really presented to you in black and white. Like the grey morality area isn't very much celebrated or like talked about a lot in Chinese films. Especially modern day Chinese films. Mm. Yeah, propagating passive or negative outlook in life, worldview, and value system, deliberately exaggerating the ignorance of ethnic groups or dark side of society. So again, these are very subjective terms and phrases. So how are you supposed to ascertain who is like how much is too much, and what is what does it mean to show the dark side of society? Isn't that just society? You know what I'm trying to say? Like, mm. can how do you write a sad story without without being accused that you are exaggerating the dark side of life when it is just part of life. I feel like this might be why a lot of Chinese films have happy endings even if a sad ending would make more sense logically. Like you yeah. always try to like yuan hui lai, like make the story rounded and like whole. Wholesome. Wholesome but it's not always the case in life and it, I think if you overly paint like the world in like rose tinted lenses through films then it also like creates a kind of imagination that can't be brought to real life so yeah, after watching the film, you might become even more disappointed in your own life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another aspect would be advertising religious extremism, stirring up ambivalence and conflicts between different religions and between believers and non-believers, causing disharmony in the community. So again, religion is a very sensitive topic in China. Mm. We will get more into religion later on the concept of ghosts, mm. as well as advocating harm to the environment, animal cruelty, um, killing and consuming nationally protected animals, like endangered species. <laughs> so like, I don't know, it's... Uh, 
Okay, again, it limits the creativity and certain artistic expressions of directors. And also showing excessive drinking, smoking, and other bad habits. And um, I remember this one was quite funny because I know that there are some shows where the person who is smoking literally has like a mosaic around their mouth. It literally makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just feel like overall when you look at all these censorship laws, some of them feel like it's really like handling the entire society like a baby. Yeah. Like you cannot be exposed to all these things because the moment you see them, you will learn all the bad things just by consuming film. Yeah. Again, there are some... So, like, these laws are kind of uh, muddy and murky when it comes to enforcement because mm. I can think off the top of my head some films that have explicitly featured certain things that are banned on this list but are still being shown on television or in cinemas. So, again, it's not a very, you know, even enforcement of such censorship laws, but this is, like, kind of the guidelines to what is allowed or, you know, encouraged in terms of Chinese filmmaking and what is not allowed to be shown. Mm. However, one thing that is quite universally banned in Chinese film is ghosts. This, uh, so China has a very long history that is deeply rooted in different religious and spiritual beliefs, mm. mostly Buddhism and Taoism. So in underdeveloped areas, which make up about 40% of the total population, spiritual beliefs and rituals are indispensable. Mm. So because of this, the Chinese Communist Party believes that if rural people are exposed to horror films that include supernatural figures, people will take them seriously. Essentially, they don't want people to be backwards thinking mm. and to believe in supernatural things that are not real. I kind of understand that sentiment but outrightly banning all supernatural elements especially ghosts don't really make a lot of sense I mean um <laughs> I mean sometimes especially for films that draw inspiration from um let's say ancient culture or like texts or like historical texts that make reference to like spirituality and stuff like that then making references to ghosts is actually more realistic in a way because like it parallels the kind of beliefs that people have back and, in the day yeah back in the day and I feel like trying to create like a whole like back, back again to the point of like trying to create a pristine image of modern China like weeding out all these elements that are actually embedded in people's like real lived experiences just to look like you know I think the parallel is um, modern backwards technology science believing in spirits and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, correct. Yeah. It's like this false dichotomy yeah. that these things cannot coexist. I understand the CCP's concern, but at the same time, it again limits the creativity of directors, especially within the horror genre. Mm. So be, can you imagine if you want to make horror films without ghosts? It's incredibly difficult. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, so like Chinese horror is not really a very big deal. I, I've never watched a Chinese horror film in my there life. There are very limited <laughs> Chinese horror films. So a lot of the times, the horror have to be like, is it like psychological horror? Yeah, thriller? a lot of the times horror films have to be either thrillers or psychological horror instead mm. of supernatural horror. Mm. So one example of this strict enforcement of censorship laws would be Farewell My Concubine, which was objected due to its portrayal of homosexuality, suicide mm. and violence perpetuated under Mao Zedong's communist government mm. during the Cultural Revolution. However, this film won many awards, including the different film festivals. So the ban of the film in China was met with international outcry. Fear, fearing that there was no choice and that it will hurt China's bid for the 2000 Summer Olympics, <laughs> officials allowed the film to resume public showings. However, the, the showings were actually a censored version. Mm. So scenes dealing with the Cultural Revolution, homosexuality, as well as the final scene of the suicide was cut out in order to... Spoiler. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> was cut out in order to pass censors. So, like, again, a lot of the things that need to be talked about, especially important social issues or like the impact of certain Chinese government policies in mm. the past and the repercussions to this day, these things should be and ought to be explored in all forms of art, including films, in order to kind of expose the general public to it. But the government does not want that. The government does not want anything but a peachy clean um, retelling of history which is what they always pay money to produce in the different Jianguo films. Yeah. So it is very frustrating because Farewell My Concubine is an amazing movie and I feel like more movies like that should be able to be produced without fear of censorship. Mm. I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> so to end off, we have a few thoughts. Hmm. Firstly, we would really like to reinforce the idea that there are many good Chinese films, even if compared to all of them, the Chinese good ones are rare. And there's a lot of potential for the Chinese film industry to gain international popularity. But my personal theory 
that my personal theory as to why Chinese films will never really reach the height of Korean films mm. right now. Like for example, with Parasite mm-hmm. and with a lot of um, Korean dramas, it's because China is such a niche context as compared to other parts of the world. Because China is really very closed off as compared to other countries in Asia. They do not access the same internet as mm. the rest of the world. They really do not have a lot of cultural outputs as well as cultural exports. The country, so like the context that China is operating under, including its policies, its social economic problems, its struggles, is so exclusive to China. So mm. one example would be the one-child policy. It is not enacted anywhere else in the world. So all the social ramifications of the one-child policy, is, if you are going to discuss that in a film, it's never going to be relatable to the international audience. Mm. Whereas if you look at Parasite, they're talking about social economic and class struggles. That is relatable no matter where you are. But like a lot of the struggles and a lot of the social problems in China is just not seen anywhere else in the world. So it can be very hard for international audiences to resonate with that. Another reason why I think Chinese films don't really bother trying to branch out to different parts of the world is because they have such a massive internal market. Essentially, if you achieve commercial success within China, it's more than enough for you to get your money back. Mm, Like you don't need to actually branch out to other countries when you have such a massive market to adhere to and pander to back at home. Mm. As long as you're commercially successful at home, that's all that matters. You already have so much money to make. Like they do not really care about making more money elsewhere because it is very difficult for them anyway. And lastly, we feel that just because there are censors and all the issues that the entertainment industry is facing right now, it doesn't really excuse how terrible Chinese movies are right now. And this involves the cultural illiteracy of the people involved and the power of capital to sway film production processes. And But at the end of the day, we are also seeing some bits of hope in uh, in terms of audience reception. So, for example, I know both of us, we watch a lot of film film commentator websites or like uh, YouTubers. And there's also a more aware and vocal audience, such as the people who call out like Man Jiang Hong's illiterate uh, PR team. And there's also people who are um, amassing enough capital on their own to make independent films using other avenues. And on YouTube, I see like mainland Chinese people actually climbing over the firewall to like interact with people who have differing opinions out there. So um, as much as right now, the entertainment industry, especially the film industry, is in a lot of deep shit, um, we just hope that you know, people will be aware enough and to compare uh, the whatever co- content they are consuming within the mainland with whatever is outside to see the entire diversity of possibility when it comes to film production. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much for listening in for our episode on Chinese films. Our next episode will be on Chinese animation. So please look forward to that. Thank you for listening in and time to plug our socials. Okay, so we have an Instagram at china.through.sglasses where we will put our highlight reels and where you can interact with us. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and even YouTube. Yeah, okay, so see you around for our next episode on Chinese animations. Bye! Bye.